Nobody likes a hypocrite. Amen? Here's the problem. We're all a bunch of hypocrites. And so you just said you didn't like yourself. And some of you went, amen. Um, yeah, it's true. No, no, nobody likes a hypocrite. Um, you know, I, my dad would sometimes say to me growing up, do as I say, not as I do. Anybody ever heard that? Anybody's dad ever said that? I hated it. Do you know what I hate more than that? When I look at my kids and say, do as I say, not as I do. I'm like, I'm turning into my old man. And I don't, I don't like it. I don't, I, don't, I don't like being a hypocrite. Um, I, I don't like hypocrisy. I don't like it when somebody else does it. And I for sure don't like it when I do it. When I look in the mirror and I think, man, that was hypocritical of me. I, I, don't, I don't like that. Um, rules for thee, but not for me. You've heard that before? Um, you know, that's, uh, that's been the way in our, our country. Like, we, we, in our culture, kind of rebel against that. You, if you recall, during COVID, a lot of the people who were kind of making these rules and regulations during COVID, they would get caught breaking the rules that they made. And it would go; it, those videos would go viral. And so you would have a governor that was somewhere, and and he was, you know, enforcing these sort of draconian kind of things. And then he would go, and he would break them, and somebody would catch it on camera because everything you do now is caught on camera. And it would just like it, it would it would go viral. And we we just as a culture we do not like hypocrisy. And so because we don't like hypocrisy we have a value for authenticity, right? We, we like, man, we want what's real. We want what is authentic. And so if someone comes forward and they, they kind of have this uh, kind of performative personality about them and you're like, is that person legit? Are they real? You're kind of skeptical of somebody who puts like this best foot forward all the time. Do y'all do that or is that just me? Y'all are looking at me like, I don't know. Like, no, trust me, you do that. You, when, when somebody feels to you, like when, a, when you encounter a politician and they feel like a used car salesman, we, we reject it. We, we don't like that anymore in, in our culture. But can I tell you, I, I think that the worst kind of hypocrisy is religious hypocrisy. You see, politician... They're hypocritical about something, or a, a teacher, or somebody else, your parent. Like, that goes away. Like, it won't matter in two years. Uh, it probably won't matter in two months. There's a decent chance it won't matter in two weeks. But religious hypocrisy, it can have, it can have outcomes that will matter in a million years. It, it will matter in eternity. Not just in this life, but the next we're in a moment in time where we've kind of got a deconstruction movement. We've got people leaving the church. And, and man, as, as scholars and uh, different folks study, like the deconstruction movement, and they study why are people leaving the church. Uh, this, is what they're, this is what they're finding. And I, I, I don't have necessarily a ton of anecdotal evidence, but I have experiential evidence that says this is, this is true, that... Many folks that, that I've talked to, granted, some just want to be wild and rebellious and do the things of the world. Some just want to go live as the world. But, but there are others who experienced religious hypocrisy, and it turned them off from Jesus. It turned them off from church, and they want to walk away, uh, walk away from the church because of some hypocrisy that they've experienced. Now, sometimes... That, that comes because there's a leader, there's a pastor, a youth pastor, some, a deacon in the church who, who's gotten uh, caught in some sort of scandal. The thing that they did in the dark is being exposed in the light. And people go, oh man, hypocrite, I can't, can't, trust, tr can't trust the church and walk away. Many that walk away from the faith, they do it because of their parents, their parents' hypocrisy. You see? They would go to church and they'd watch their parents put on their, their, their church clothes and their church face and go to church and, and act like um, 
these righteous, holy people, and then they'd go home and with, but behind closed doors with the curtain pulled, pulled down, the shades showed in the dark, they saw how they would really act. They would see uh, uh, a, a dad show up at church and, and know how dad treats mom and the kids. And so that level of hypocrisy within, within Christianity is, is a turnoff. It causes people to leave the faith. So when it's just religious performance on the outside and nothing has changed on the inside, this is what we must know. It is not genuine faith in Christ. So as we open up the text today, here's what I want you to know. Here's the big truth. When you believe the gospel, it changes the way you live this life and the next life. What I mean by that is when you truly believe in the gospel, that's the good news. That's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The gospel is the story of Jesus. How God sent his son to the earth to redeem us, to save us, to reconcile him unto himself. And the method in which he did that was the, to be crucified on the cross. He was killed. He took on our sins. Uh, he, he, he was sinless, but yet took on our sins he paid the price for those sins in his crucifixion and his death. He was put in the tomb, and God raised him to life on the third day, proving he was God. The good news of the gospel is that those who believe in him are saved. When you believe that message, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the gospel, it changes the way you live this life. And it's not just this life in this moment, but it matters for all eternity the next life, the after life. So, if you would, if you have your Bible, uh, turn to Luke chapter 12. If not, you can follow along on the screen. We're continuing in the book of Luke. Um, you, you would need to remember, if you've been here in the past weeks, uh, where we've been in the scripture, because this is part of the same story. This isn't just as we turn into a new chapter. Remember when Luke wrote the book of, of Luke, there were, weren't chapter and verse marks, right? This is just a continuation of the story. Jesus has been dealing with these Pharisees and, and lawyers. He was invited uh, to dinner, invited to go and eat at a, at a lawyer's house, and he goes in and he eats with them. And this is after, after sometime after that, uh, so maybe the same day he's left dinner and he begins to talk. His audience... Um, is his disciples, but also the crowd that has gathered. So, verse 1 says, we'll be reading through verse 12. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people have gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples, First, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men... The Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you will say for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Now, we'll start taking this apart there at verse 12. And I'm going to chase a little tangent that doesn't have a lot to do with the sermon real quick. I'm just going to run a, run a quick rabbit. We're going to catch it and we're going to get right back here. All right. 
He says, in the meantime, so, when so many thousands of people had gathered together, they were trampling one another. This, this phenomenon happened with Jesus when he would teach. When he would go to a new place, people would want to hear what he'd have to say. And so they would gather together. So here he had been teaching in this home. And people had heard that he was in town teaching. And so they flock around to hear what he's have to say. So much so, they're, they're like trampling on one another. Like this ought to be our mentality. That we ought to, like just, who was that that was in Denver? The Ed, Ed, Ed somebody? Ed Sheeran, Swift a few weeks ago. Chris Stapleton a few weeks ago. Before that, like stadium concert tours. Like if Jesus were here today, would we pack in? Would we trample on? Well, I would hope so. Well, I want you to know something. He is here through his word. He uses his word. We ought to trample in. We ought to close in around and hear God's word. I'll tell you, um, I'm encouraged right now by something. Um, we're, we're seeing in our church growth. We're seeing, we're seeing people want to come and want to hear. And we're seeing people dive into God's word. We're seeing people dive into uh, to groups and Bible studies into church. We're seeing baptisms. We've baptized more people this year than any other year. You know, from January to December, we, we hit that back in the spring. My prayer is that we see uh, more come to faith this year than we have in the history of our church combined as a young church plant. That wouldn't be that hard, but I, I pray that it happens. When I talk to my friends all over the country, when I get on social media, when I read news articles, this is what I know. That it's not just our church that this is happening. That all across the country, in, in, in America, and we know that it's happening other places in the world, but particularly in our country that had seen such decline in interest in spiritual things, we're seeing an uptick. We're seeing, like my, my friends across the country are saying, we've baptized more people than we've baptized any other year. We're, 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 seeing, we're adding services. We're seeing people fill our churches. It is good that we are spiritually thirsty and hungry. Let us be that way. End of rabbit, back in sermon. He says to his disciples, so he's talking to them first. He talks to them, and then he kind of speaks to the crowd. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you've whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Here's my first big idea. We hate hypocrisy and value authenticity, but that misses the mark. Our aim should be godliness. Twice a week at our house, I'll be somewhere, maybe I'm in the office, maybe I'm in the basement. And I'll, all of a sudden, it's just a quiet and peaceful house. And all of a sudden, I'll hear, Thwop! 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 Now, if you, you know our family, you know that I have two boys, James and John Owen. And we call them the Sons of Thunder. And they're called Sons of Thunder for a reason. A couple. They own up to the name. They're loud. And typically, when I hear some sort of loud noise, this is my response. And my, my, my sons make fun of me for this. They clown me over this. I go, boys, like that every time. And like, I like, what are, you know, like, what are you doing? But when I hear this particular, Fwah! I smile. I put a smile on my face because I know it's not my boys. It's actually my wife. One of the things I got out of COVID was a bread-making wife. I don't know if anybody else got that. But my, my wife makes bread uh, at least twice a week, and our family eats, eats that bread. I, I typically cook French toast with it. That's how I eat it. But um, she, she makes bread. And so if you open up our refrigerator, you will find, you'll see a bowl or some sort of canister with a starter in it, and she'll take that, that out, and she'll put it on the table. And, I, look, I don't know how it all works. I just know it tastes good. Right, and I know that she, she that that bowl of starter, that container of starter. I'm probably saying the wrong. It's probably got a specific name, but uh, that that starter has yeast in it, and that yeast in there, you cannot take that yeast out. There's nothing you can do to that that dough starter that you can remove that yeast. But when she takes it out, 
and she starts adding this stuff to it, and she starts working the dough, that yeast spreads throughout the dough. Uh, when, when, she's, when she's slamming that, it's called, I think it's called kneading. She kneads the dough, and man, she kneads the mess out of that dough. I'm telling you, uh, we, we joke at our house and say that Jennifer does, like, secretly does CrossFit because she's like freakishly strong. She, that, do, that dough is uh, activating the gluten, I think is what she says it's doing. Well, that gluten is activated, <laughs> right? I mean, for 20 solid minutes, you know, and, and I just love it. I'm just smiling because I know, like, in a few hours, that warm smell, and we're going to eat, and it's going to be wonderful. Um, there, there, there's a, a verse in the book of Galatians where Paul says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A translation of that would be a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. His context, when he says that, uh, it's, to, uh, it's at the church of Galatia, and there are these, these folks who are bringing in circumcision and making it essential for salvation. And he's, he's saying, hey, when you add something, something like this, it works through the whole thing and makes the whole thing bad. When we say a little yeast works through the whole ba- batch of dough, it's saying, like, you've got this whole thing, and a little bit of bad is going to work through, work through and make the whole thing no good anymore. So when Jesus says, beware of the leaven of, uh, of the Pharisees, he's saying that this leaven, this thing the Pharisees are doing, is going to work through the whole system, the whole, uh, the, the, the whole religious mindset, what they're doing, and it's going to make the whole thing bad. And that is hypocrisy we hate hypocrisy we we don't want hypocrisy but this is what we got to know like it's working through the whole thing making the whole thing bad this week um i saw a video of of some i would say conservative scholars i want to use the word scholar loosely um, sitting, sitting in a, a circle, this thing's being filmed, and there, there are, sure enough, some really sharp minds in there and others that I just don't know. Uh, Jordan Peterson is in the room, and Dennis Prager is in the room, and somebody brings up a question about pornography. They said, is pornography good, or is it, is it bad? And you can tell most, there's a lot of people in the room who are like, no, pornography is bad, but Dennis Prager's at least brave enough to kind of step up and say, well, I'm a Jew, you guys, some of you are Christian, some of you aren't, but I'm, I'm a Jew, and in Christianity, you have this ethic of Jesus, and you believe that Jesus said, um, if a man were to look at a woman in lust, he's committed adultery. And so, Dennis Prager says, well, in Judaism, and, and, and look, some, some Jewish people would refute what he had to say, but this, I'm just telling you what he said. He says, in Judaism, we, we don't have that kind of ethic. And so we care about externals. We care about is what, what's on the outside. We care about what's putting, put forth. We care about behavior. We don't necessarily care about what's on the inside. So we don't think that a man who looks at a woman lustfully is actually committing a sin. And therefore, he goes on to justify in multiple ways why it's okay. And then... Uh, Jordan Peterson gives a, like a clinical psychology reason why it's bad, and then a Christian gives a biblical reason of why it's bad. And so, here's what you have to know. Here, here's, here's why this misses the mark. We care about what is on the inside. We, we care about uh, the, the heart. If you're at this church very long at all, you'll, you're, you'll hear me say, what God works in your heart works out. It can't just be merely about external performance. It has to be about God changing you from the inside out, changing your desires, changing your wants, transforming you. You're a new creation in Christ. The old man has gone. The new man has come. Uh, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. The, the, the man who once lived in the flesh now by, lives by faith in the Son of God. And so you, this can be seen here. Beware of this leaven of the Pharisees that's outwardly performative, but inwardly it's rotten. And it's that, that what is inside is going to work its way out. And so these next verses like, ought to really give us great pause when he says nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. 
Listen, what you do in the dark gets exposed in the light. Now, here's just here, here's a reality. There, there may be some things that you do in life. There may be a sin that you commit, and you you do this in the dark, and you tell no one about it. You you have like the most tight-lipped mouth ever to exist, and you tell no one about it. And you take it to the grave, no one else knowing, and it never gets exposed. That is not probable. That is very rare, but let's just say it happens. When you meet Jesus, at your judgment day, he will know what was done in the darkness. He will know, and at that point, he will be exposed. Now, the reality is, it is not probable that any sin that we do ever does not get exposed. You will be found out. The things that I have done will be found out. Um, that, that does not seem like good news, does it? Like, no. I mean, who, 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 who here would be like, all right, if you could, if you could just like, like you're watching Sports Center and you could just like show all the highlights and lowlights and all the, the dumb things that happen and the good things that happen, like, who wants that tape shown? I don't want that tape shown. But can you, can you imagine the embarrassment that it would be as if all of a sudden your, your life just gets played before everybody? This week, uh, the, the interim president of the Southern Baptist Convention, a guy named Willie McLaurin, he, he wrote a book called The Winning Way. This week, in, in his, he was bidding to become president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He was being interviewed for the job. They found out that he lied on his resume. And the places that he said that he had degrees from, he didn't. And one of the places he listed, and a degree he listed, he never even went to school there. And he'd been lying about it for years. And as they interviewed him, they, they found out. Can you imagine the embarrassment? That was probably something done at this point. 20 years ago on a, on a resume, and all of a sudden now he's had to, had to keep it, and had to keep up with his life, and the thing that he did in the dark got exposed. Who, who would, would want that? Who would, who would want it? And so, no, we, we, we look at this and we go, well, we don't want to be hypocritical. The things that we do in the dark are seen in the light. We don't want to be hypocritical. So here's what, here's what we've, we've kind of done in our culture. In, in, in to, to run from hypocrisy, we've traded it for, for authenticity. And we've seen authenticity as a good thing. And hear me out. Authenticity is a good thing. Right? We're not, I'm not saying authenticity. Like we, we shouldn't be fake. We shouldn't just be fake for the sake of putting our best foot forward. What's become of that is so often we've ended up in this place of, well, I am who I am. This is who I am. You want me, you got me. What you see is what you get. I'm just going to do me. I'm just going to be me. Well, there's aspects of that are good. But there's aspects that aren't good. Like, I've just got these problems, these vices, these ways in which I'm holding on to the things of the world, and I'm going to keep them. Have you ever heard somebody say, you can't judge me, and misquote Scripture? It's this, this idea that, like, yeah, you can't judge me. That's like, the, that's like, oh, the greatest sin you can commit is judging somebody. Now, we've dealt with that passage in, in the book of Luke already. But, like, the reality is that when they say that, often what they follow up is, well, only God can judge me. That ought to scare you. Only God can judge me. The one who's holy and righteous and good is the one who judges. So, our aim... Isn't, isn't just authenticity. It's not to reject hypocrisy and embrace authenticity. Our aim ought to be godliness. It ought to be looking like Christ. It should look like integrity and character. Integrity is doing the right thing when no one is looking. That, that should be the thing that we're seeking to, to embrace is this, the character of Christ to, to, to put on like God's chosen ones, the, these attributes that he says we ought to have. Remember, uh, uh, just a few weeks ago in chapter 11, a woman comes to, to Jesus and says, Blessed is the womb that bore you. And he, he corrects her and he says, No, blessed is rather the ones who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed is the one 
who is godly. Integrity is doing the right thing. And, and integrity is following Christ. It's hearing his word and doing it. So we ought to, we ought to like, sure, we want to be authentic, but we want to be authentic pursuit of Jesus. That means we're able to say, yeah, I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I'm but trying to become more and more like Christ. I'm not trying to live like the world. I'm trying to live like Christ. Continue, verse 4. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. And so, there's a few things going on here. One, the Pharisees feared other people's perceptions. They feared what the other people thought. They tried to stay in power. Another thing is going on is that the disciples, like, there, there's this uh, temptation for them to fear the Pharisees and the lawyers because they hold this cultural power and eventually... Those Pharisees and, and, and those lawyers would be the people who'd want to kill these disciples. They'd want to kill Christians. They would persecute them. They would kill them. And they, by the way, these are the people who, who uh, the group in which that would kill Jesus. And so, don't fear man. I warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you're more value than many sparrows. So here's my next big idea. When you fear God, you don't have to fear life in this world. When you fear God, I'll say it again. When you fear God, you don't have to fear life. Life in this world. You know, I think we live in a culture that largely doesn't fear God. I think there's not a, a healthy respect. We're talking about what that fear means. But, but what it means, we don't do. Now, why would we? So let me, let me just ask this question. If, you, if, if you're somebody who doesn't believe in God, you, doesn't believe, you don't believe there's a God in heaven, let's say you're, you're looking at this from an atheistic worldview, uh, maybe an agnostic worldview, you think there is a God, but he has no power. There could be higher, higher powers or higher forces or whatever, but he doesn't care what's going on. Like, if you're viewing it that way, why would you fear God? And so there's a certain percentage of the population right there that, that would not fear God. But you would think that if people say, I believe in God, what number of those people would say, I fear God? Well, I don't, I don't think it would be Nearly what it ought to be. I don't think it's many. I, I, a few weeks ago, uh, in, in, our, in our sermons, we talked about uh, the number of people who no longer believe in hell. Uh, even heaven. Both heaven and hell, uh, which, which has been uh, one of the centerpieces of Christianity, to know that there is a life after death, that there is an afterlife, that that number is coming down. So if you don't believe that there is a hell... And that you could go there, why would you fear the one who could send you there, right? You're, you're losing in your mind the credibility of uh, the scriptures, and so you're not fearing. You're not fearing God. I want to tell you something. Fearless living is foolish living. You know... Uh, you know the feeling that you get in your stomach? Like if you were to walk up, imagine this is a cliff, and you're to walk up to this edge of this big cliff, and you kind of get this nervous feeling in your stomach. Does anybody have that? I don't. I don't get that. I, I don't have a fear of heights. It's just not, not in me. And so I, I don't know why, uh, but I can walk up to a cliff. I can ride amusement rides. I can get up super high, and I don't get that feeling in my stomach. Um, Therefore, I can, I, can, I can be around a cliff, and I can like walk up to the edge, and I can make other people nervous, and I can walk up and kind of go like, whoop, you know, do something like that, and <laughs> woo, and people are like, what are you doing? I just don't have it. That's stupid. <laughs> That's foolish. God gives us that fear for a reason, because that, that cliff absolutely will not kill you. It can't kill you if you respect it, if, if you're careful with it. But if you walked up and act like an idiot, there's a good chance you die. 
Right? I had to like learn. Like I had, this is something I had to like learn, be taught. Not, I don't have the natural fear. That, that and speed, those two things, they, they, they just don't, my body doesn't process them the same. And so it's stupid. It's dangerous. That's how, that's how many of us act around God. There's no, there's no fear. There, there's, there's no holding. Fear of God, um, it, it's important. I mean, he says this. Fear the one who has the authority to cast you into hell. I, I want you to understand something. That God is judge. We talk about God is love. But God is also wrath. God is also just. God doesn't give anyone any punishment that they do not deserve. Like He's a just God. He, he is a judge that gets it right every time. Here's the problem with that. We're wrong. We're sinners. All have sinned. All have broken the law. All have fallen short of the glory of God, the Bible tells us. So you're like, how is this good news? Well, that part's not. <laughs> that part's not good news. That, that, that part means that we are condemned. Here's the good news of the gospel. Is that, that God... Made a way for us to escape this. God made a way out for us. God made a way to reconcile his people unto himself. And this is why we say that the gospel is good news. That, that God looked at, at mankind. He looked at their situation. He looked at our brokenness and our sinfulness. And in the Old Testament, he made a way by a sacrificial system to, to pay this price. But in the New Testament, we have the grace of Jesus Christ... Where God, in his love for us, sends his son, Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, to live this perfect and spotless life without sin, that he would, he would by God's, God's or, uh, plan in God's hand, would be crucified on the cross, taking our punishment, taking the death that we deserved, and he would be buried. And this is God proving that he's God, proving his way, that he took this dead man, his son, Jesus Christ, who bore our sins, and on the third day, he raised him to life. And so he shows us that he is all-powerful, that he has the ability, ability to, to save. And therefore, we should realize this is the one who has the authority to save. He has the, the, the judgment. And so we say, in one hand, We've got to fear him. We should, we should look at him with this awe and respect. This means to give him the love and respect that he deserves. It's respect, it's awe, it's love, it's submission. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to live in fear of him. Listen to what he says in this same passage, in this same context. Fear not. You are worth more value than many sparrows. And we're going to talk about value and worth next week and what this, what this means, that, that what we're worth to God. But we're worth His Son. We're worth His Son dying on the cross for our sins that we may know Him. And so, here's what the Bible teaches us. Proverbs 1-7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The, the, this, this holy, reverent respect and awe that leads us to, to, to submission and obedience is the beginning of knowledge. And if you despise that, that means that you despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. It's insight in the ways of the world to fear the Lord. It's the beginning place. Proverbs 14, 27 says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. And that to fear the Lord is the, very, is the starting place to, to escape the snares of Satan and death. Psalm 19, 9 says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever." The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. It's good for us. 
Listen to how the early church grew in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9 verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. And so here's this beautiful thing is that when you fear God, you don't have to fear life in this world. There's nothing in this world that can hurt you. Your mind, your mind's attention and your heart's affection is on the Holy One, the Creator, the Sustainer, the One with all the power. And so he tells them this. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And so he tells them, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I'm going to acknowledge. The one who acknowledges me, not the one who runs from me and turns from me, not the one who rejects me, I'm going to acknowledge before the angels of God. That ought to scare you. You ought to look at these verses and go, oh man, I don't want to deny Christ, but I, I want to cry, call Christ Lord. Now, verse 10. This verse is something we, we see, this theological idea of the unpardonable sin or the unforgivable sin. Is there any sin that I can commit that will keep God from forgiving me? Well, yes, there's one. And it's this one. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And so we have to ask the question, what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? How do you, how do you commit blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Well, ultimately, at the very end of the day, this is the, the sin of unbelief. It's not believing God is who he says he is. It's not believing that Jesus is who he says he is. It's not believing that Jesus Christ came to the earth and died to save you. It's not believing that Jesus was God's son and that he raised him to life on the third day. That's ultimately what the sin of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. Now notice, it says that some will blaspheme the, the, Jesus, but they'll be forgiven. I want you to think of the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul um, would, would kill, kill men in the name of Jesus and would reject Jesus, but yet would somehow, not rejecting God, would still end up saved. You see, I think what, the, what he's showing us here, that the rejection of the Holy Spirit, it's a, it's a final thing. It's the seeing God move and work. And like we see in Romans uh, chapter 1, where they knew the truth about God, where they were without excuse, and they traded the truth about God for a lie and worshipped created things rather than the Creator. It's that at some point in life, as they blasphemed against the Holy Spirit and they rejected the Holy Spirit, their heart got hardened to the point that they would reject God the rest of their life. Now, ultimately, we look at it and we go, it's here, but it's decisions that lead up to that. It's a rejection of who God is. Now, you may be sitting here today going, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Have I committed a sin and that, that, that God would not forgive me of? Well, here's the classic answer to that, is if you're asking the question, then the answer is no. If you're asking that question, that means your heart is not hard. It means that the Holy Spirit is moving and working in your heart to, to have you evaluate your life. Am I a sinner, a need, and a savior? Is God real? Which brings me to this next big idea. And it's this. The greatest decision you will ever make is to believe the gospel, repent, and be baptized, and live out your faith in Christ. This, 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 is, this is what it means when... Right here in, in this passage, when he says, be unashamed of me, it makes me think of the book of Romans uh, 1, 1 16, where Paul says, I am unashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
It makes me think of Romans 10, 9, and 10, where, where Paul says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised his son from the dead, that you will be saved. You believe the gospel. You'll believe that for God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. In your heart, it's where it starts. Believe in Jesus today. And after you do that, it, it, you, you're repenting. You're saying, I'm no longer living for the world and for myself, but I'm living for Jesus. You're saying, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I once lived in the flesh, I now live by faith in the Son of God. The Bible tells us that those who, who believe the gospel, who are unashamed of the gospel, that they're saved. And when they do that, when they repent, then they should be baptized. Baptism in itself doesn't save you. Being baptized isn't something that, that's like an ordinance that you do that gives you right standing with God. No, that's faith. Jesus is the one that gives you right standing with God, and it's faith in him. But baptism, we say, is an outward expression of an inward possession. It's, it's showing the world on the outside what's happened on the inside. Baptism is symbolic. It, the, the water in a, in, a, in, a, in a baptism is symbolizing a tomb. And we're saying we have been buried with Jesus in baptism and raised to walk in a new way of life. And that means we live out our faith in Christ. Just like Jesus said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it and do it. What God works on the inside works out. And let me tell you the most beautiful thing about this. Verse 11, and when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Here's the next big idea. Is that the Holy Spirit dwells inside the believer and empowers them to live their life in Christ. We have an extreme example. This is what's going to happen to the disciples. They're going to be brought forward to the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities. They're going to be flogged, beaten, and killed. And the extreme example he's saying here is that the hypocrisy of, of, of these Pharisees is actually going to so corrupt this thing that they're going to want to kill you. And my Holy Spirit is going to give you what you need in that moment. Do not fear these men who can kill the body but cannot kill your soul. Obey me, the one who can protect your soul. Fear not. You are worth so much to me. I care for you. I love you. What we see in Scripture, Matthew 28, when Jesus gives uh, the, the great commission and he tells them to go, he tells these disciples to go into all the world and to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What comfort does he give them? But lo, I am with you to the very end of the age. So here's the good news, Christian. Is that when you place your faith and trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into your heart, lives in you, is changing you, is making you like Christ. Christ is making you want to pursue godliness. So in every situation, whether it be some sort of persecution or some sort of, of temptation, temptation in the darkness, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit gives you the power to overcome. When you open up the book of Acts, you see that the proof is right there. You see in the stoning of Stephen that the Holy Spirit was upon him. And you look when they're, gonna, when they're bringing him before that he wasn't anxious but he preached the gospel. You'll see it with Peter. You'll see it throughout of each of the disciples' lives. Each of them except John martyred. And so they do it. And so this is the good news that you can live your life unashamed of Christ, unashamed of the gospel because of the righteousness of Christ. Because Christ is in you. Because His Holy Spirit indwells in you. Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Why do the righteous get to live this bold life? It's because of what Christ has done. In John 16.33, Jesus says, I have, I have said these things to you, 
that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Put your hope and faith in Christ today. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. And Lord, I, I pray that we would live our lives by it. That we would use it as the compass that points us to you, that points us to live for you. Lord, that we would, we would repent of hypocrisy. And we would seek you out. That we would run to you as Savior. Lord, I want to pray for our our church living in this culture. That they would be authentic followers of Jesus in this culture. They would not be ashamed of their faith. But they would say, yes, I'm with Christ. I follow Christ. That they do it with their families. That they do it with their neighbors, their co-workers at school. Lord, for the college students in the room on on a campus that is increasing persecution of Christians. That they would be willing to stand up and say, no, I'm with Jesus. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. They'd follow you all the days of their life. Father, move and work in our lives. Let your Holy Spirit change us from the inside out. Lord, for those in the room today who don't have a relationship with you, who've never placed their faith and trust in you. Lord, today would you move and work that they would cry out in this prayer, in this time of response and say, Father, uh, Father God, I believe in you. I thank you. thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ to die for me and forgiving me of my sins. Lord, let me follow you. And Lord, they come forward in repentance and in, in baptism. And they begin to grow and be discipled grow more and more like you, that they would pursue godliness. Father, move and work in our midst today. Move and work in our lives as we go out into the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing a song of response.